So tonight we have a um, very interesting talk on Cuba. And our speakers are Paul Basich and Sol Luke Aluka. Um, Paul has been an active bird since his, his early teens in New York City. Concerns, his concerns include an interest in bird conservation and policy, as well as studies in avian breeding biology, waterfowl, and the practice of bird feeding over the decades. Among his many activities, he's worked for the American Bird Association in multiple roles, has worked for the National Wildlife Refuge System on a consultant basis on issues of popular birding and parallel refuge receptiveness and has led or co-led trips from Alaska to Cuba. In addition, Paul co-edits with Wayne Peterson, the popular monthly birding community e-bulletin and writes a regular column for Birdwatcher's Digest. In 2014, Paul received the Ducks Unlimited Wetland Conservation Achievement Award in the category of communications. Soul has been very busy. She spent 10 years in human rights efforts in Central America. Um, has taught at the University of Salerno in Italy and worked in the Philippines on the elimination of the exploitation of women in the international sex trade and other women's health issues. And is the projects director of the Friendship Association in St. Augustine. Association sponsors delegations to Cuba in support of their conservation projects and related educational and cultural events in Cuba in the US. Sol is also the managing editor of, uh, I don't know, it's Spanish, but it's Edicones Nuevos Mundos, the publishing branch of the Friendship Association, which has pioneered publications on the birds, culture, and natural history of Cuba. So welcome, Paul and Sol. And um, without further ado, I be begin the presentation. Thank you, Mary. Uh, can you hear me all right? Uh, can you be a little louder? A little right, let's soft. see if I can get a little louder. Hold on a second. Hmm, I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to go to volume. I'm going to increase volume. Let's see. Any better? It's a little bit better. Okay. Any better? I think it's fine. All right. Well, that's going to have to do. <laughs> uh, yes. All right. Good. Uh, share. That's terrific. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Soleil and I will give you a presentation. I'll probably do about two thirds to three quarters of it. That's because I remember the birds and she remembers the people. And uh, she's going to have to correct me here and there on location and some of the people that we're showing. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be to go to Cuba about a dozen times, almost a dozen times now. My first time was, was 2006. Uh, Sony has been there dozens and dozens and dozens of times going back decades, and uh, her experience is invaluable. But we're going to discuss Burning and Beyond in Cuba here, the title, Opportunities and Lessons for Today. And uh, I could probably orient to three different ways. I could talk about birders, or I could talk about birds, or I could talk about the people. I'm going to do basically all three with Sole's help. And we'll start off with the birders here. We're watching. We're in the, uh, the uh, town of Playa Larga in the Zapata Swamp area, uh, watching a couple of uh, uh, bee hummingbirds, smallest birds in the world. And uh, there's Sole looking up. She's not looking at the hummingbirds. I don't know what she was looking at at this particular point. Here's my friend Larry Balch. Some of you may know Larry, the past president of, uh, a past president of the American Birding Association. And this was our group, our busload of around uh, 12 to 15 people, which is as far as we go with a bus. And uh, we're having a good time. But we can focus on people, uh, excuse me, the people, the birders, or we can focus on the birds, 
Uh, this is about as good a photo as uh, you can get. It has a black border around it. The black border means it's my photo. This is about as experienced and as clean a photo of birds that, that I do. I just point and shoot and that's it. Uh, this, of course, as you may know, is a Cuban trogon. And uh, focusing on the birds, especially the pandemic is extremely, excuse me, the endemics is extremely important for us uh, as birders, and especially since a lot of their endemics are endangered. Or we can focus on the people. And you will notice I have the frame here in green. If you see a black frame, it's my photo, or it's something I've taken from um, a chart or a map. If you see a uh, red frame, it's uh, an image that I've borrowed from friends um, that I've, uh, of birds or locations or uh, photographers. And if you see one in green, which is my favorite, uh, it's a image of uh, the folks, our colleagues, our counterparts in Cuba with whom we have a close relationship and we uh, mutually help in uh, our mutual appreciation of their bird life and, and uh, wildlife in the country. Uh, from left to right, this is um, Michael Canizares. Michael is one of our guides. He's the former president of the Zoological Association, I think it's called, in Cuba. Next to him in uh, the blue shirt, is Rosendo Martinez. Rosendo is retired. He's the former head of the visitor engagement of the national park system. And even in retirement, he's engaged all the time, it seems, in uh, uh, wildlife appreciation and ava tourism and nature tourism, and promoting that among his uh, colleagues and former colleagues. Then in the, it, with the tie and the white hat is our bus driver, Ronel. Um, having a good bus driver is absolutely essential when you visit Cuba. The bus drivers, if you have a good one, they know all the places to stop for the best meals or the best uh, pull-offs, um, the best locations for snacks and gasoline, et cetera, et cetera. And on the, on the right is uh, our friend Adrian. Adrian is a local birder from the Zapata Swamp area, Playa Larga. And he is a fabulous um, casa particular. It's a casa de renta, a, a homestay, or what we would call an Airbnb at Playa Larga. So this is just an introduction. And I'd like to now change the title a bit in terms of calling this breakthrough birding in Cuba. So this is a good background for us. I'm going to run through uh, three core locations that no matter whom you travel with to Cuba, if you're lucky enough to go, you'll probably visit Vinales, in the, the region of Vinales, the region of Zapata, which is probably the most important place in Cuba for birds, and of course, Havana itself. If you're lucky enough, you may have one or two side trips uh, for some birds, depending upon um, what your priorities are, and you'll get to know that. And we'll quick, whoops, excuse me, whoops, we'll quickly visit I move too fast. We'll quickly visit Guanajuato Vives on the uh, west coast, the north coast of the island of Cuba with uh, many resorts. Baracoa on the east coast, on the east tip of Cuba. It's Soledad's favorite place in Cuba just about. And uh, Topes de Coyantes, Coyantes in the Escambre Mountains, uh, which is an interesting uh, location also. And then we'll also have uh, a quick visit for some other uh, educational engagements. Cuba itself, of course, is about the size of, uh, say, Virginia or Tennessee. As you know, it's south of, uh, of uh, Florida. It's uh, 42,000 square miles. It has an official uh, census of around 11.2 uh, million people, of whom um, almost two and a half million live in the Havana area. The ethnic makeup is complicated. Uh, according to preconceived categories, a biological ancestry um, on markers uh, about eight, 10 years ago indicated that the genetic ancestry of the island is about 72% European, 
20% African, 8% indigenous, and they're also about uh, 1% Asian and uh, of uh, Chinese and Japanese extraction. The bird species, um, oh, by the way, and the places that we're gonna visit, as I mentioned before, are uh, Vinales over here, uh, the Zapata Swamp over here, and Havana. Those are the three core locations. And you see they're not far from each other. But from any one of these locations, you can take a, take a, a side trip to Guanajuato Rivas on the, on the west uh, tip of the island, uh, or you could go to the uh, north, um, north Islands, uh, indicated here, or Baracoa and the location over here, or um, the Escambre Mountains around Trinidad. So um, we're going to be looking at the, the quantity, the quality of some of the endemics, but you should know that there are almost 400 bird species that have occurred on the island. Uh, some of them are uh, among my absolute favorite birds of the world. Now, um, there are, by the way, about 20, about two dozen uh, endemics, uh, 22 are of national or international conservation concern. Among my absolute favorites are the hummingbird over here, um, Cuban blackhawk, uh, Zapata wren here, number 18, uh, Cuban toady, a wonderful bird, and Cuban troll gun. And we'll get to see those uh, once again uh, in the talk at least once or twice. And by the way, this is this is all artwork by our friend uh, Niels Navarro in his Endemic Birds of Cuba book that Soledad's um, uh, organization uh, has published and done very well. So the first trip is to Vinales. Uh, we may have landed in Havana and take a short trip to the west or in the Vinales area, uh, a location that's uh, well known for its uh, beautiful and exotic mogotes or haystack mountains. These are limestone karst structures, uh, mountains. Um, this is probably a view, as I recall, from one of the hotels um, uh, outside of town. Um, we get to see some of the first birds. Here's two of my absolutely characteristically fabulous photos. The left is of a Cuban trogon. If you can find it, good luck. That's the quality of my bird photography. Yes, it's right here, kind of left of center. Uh, that's a Cuban trogon that we are almost invariably see about every other day. And uh, on the right here is the Cuban pig meow. We'll get to bump into that the very first day or so on our trip. A diurnal um, small little owl that's a feisty uh, hunter. Uh, also in the area of Vinales, we'll get to see uh, a, a uh, regional endemic, uh, yellow-headed warbler over here, and um, one of the Caribbean regulars, which is an, uh, another one of my absolute favorites, West Indian woodpecker. In the Vinales area, we'll stay for a, a day or so. Um, we'll be checking out the Karst Mountain edges, We'll stay at a hotel like this that has uh, back doors that lead uh, to some good birding spots and the swimming pool in the backyard. We'll pass by the drying sheds of tobacco here and around the edge of the uh, karst uh, structures, the karst mountains, we'll look for this particular endemic bird, uh, the uh, solitaire, Cuban solitaire which is here, it looks a little bit like a, you mentioned hermit thrush earlier. Yeah, you put a hermit thrush in the clothes washer and run it through the dryer and that's kind of what it would look like. Uh, it's not a terribly exciting looking uh, thrush, um, but it is absolutely a, a fabulous and uh, a musical singer. Uh, you will probably hear it for 20 minutes before you ever find it in the brush but there it is. Vinales area also has an important place called Las Terrazas. It is a uh, reforestation project which began in the late 60s to recover the forest. Uh, it is today a UNESCO biosphere reserve. Here's a view from our hotel down into the area where the locals live and work. Um, there's restaurants in here, there's uh, 
by the way, it's a vegetarian restaurant in here. I'm mostly using the products of the Las Terrazas farmlands, by the way. Um, there's uh, uh, art studios, et cetera, in this particular location. And this is the lake uh, right near where we are. Here's the hotel uh, where we stay that is uh, called Hotel Mocha, my favorite. It's a uh, wonderful location. There's birding everywhere. You just have to step out the door, look out your balcony, look out your window. Um, there are some neat birds to be seen at all times. And here is a part of our group in the late afternoon going through our checklist and our guide Ernesto helping us um, go through the list. There are some feeders outside. I think people were talking about birds at their feeder at the presentation. And I have this in green because there's a lesson. And the lesson engaged here is that uh, there's this little object here, which is a uh, bird feeder. It's a bird feeder, which I'm also holding up here. It costs a buck a piece here in the US of A. It's at the dollar stores, but it is a rarity on the island of Cuba. They don't have dollar stores where they get bird feeders. The only bird feeders on the islands are ones that we bring. That is to say, the only hummingbird feeders are the ones that we bring and the other groups may bring to the island uh, for uh, use. Uh, as we leave the uh, Hotel Moca and uh, wander around the Viñales areas and Las Terrazas, we'll be fortunate enough to see uh, Olive cap barbley here. It's not on, it is um, a evergreen pine oriented species, not unlike our, perhaps our yellow throated warbler that hangs around evergreens. Um, we will look for another semi endemic, the Cuban vireo here, which is a wonderful uh, little vireo. And one of my, I have a proclivity toward really liking uh, woodpeckers. This is the Cuban green woodpecker. To me, it always looks like it should have a longer bill and that's been ratcheted down, having been used too much and just looks a little stubby, but it's a great, it's a fine uh, endemic woodpecker. And then there's the regional species here. This is a male uh, red-legged honey creeper that we see. As we go around the Vinales areas, we'll go from place to place, checking things out, checking locations. We may go to another via Saroa in the general region to stay. Up for the evening and there'll be uh, a loggerhead kingbird on the side and uh, that's not uncommon to see and as we go to uh, down the road to the Soroa orchid garden it's a little uh, uh, extravagant looking but it's a wonderful place for birds and a wonderful place for um, uh, vegetation um, Orchids, flowers, trees, bushes. Uh, we usually have one of the guides there help us uh, have a visit uh, where we where um, we get a good feeling for the plants there. And the uh, visitor, excuse me, the guides there also uh, are very helpful. They know most of the birds very well, and it's a good place that uh, we've seen for a number of the birds that we just mentioned. But you know the Vinales side trip is very good. It's a great introduction to Cuba and the Cuban people. Uh, at this point, however, after two days in the Vinales area, we go to our main location, which is the Zapata Swamp. We've gone from Vinales, bypassing Havana to the south, and going to Zapata Swamp here. It's uh, the most important place for birds, um, I think, on the island. Here it is. Um, it is a national park and a biosphere reserve and a Ramsar site. It's a complex. Um, it's not unlike us, for instance, going to uh, say Chincoteague, where we have both the Chincoteague National Seashore and Chincoteague uh, National Wildlife Refuge. There are multiple uh, uh, agencies which, which run and uh, uh, are engaged in, in this in this complex, the swamp of the Cienega de Zapata, the swamp of Zapata. Indeed, not unlike um, some of our national forests, particularly in the West, where there are towns embedded in the national forest, you also have that at Zapata Swamp. Um, so that's this is the 
entry location and we know we've made it. Uh, we've come down here the road from, uh, from the Vinales area and made the turn. That's the turn. We've entered the park at this particular point. And we're going to be visiting a number of locations. This is the Bay of Pigs over here where we're going to visit. Playa Larga is the town at the tip end, the northern end of the Bay of Pigs, which will be our base. We'll visit Playa Giron over here for some birds. Mermeja in this, in this area here, in the interior, and the very important uh, Santo Tomas area, which is right in the middle of the swamp, uh, and we take a road out. Here's another good look at some of the roads. This is a folded map. You can still see the creases. Uh, and that's uh, the way to Santo Tomas, and that's the Playa Larga where we stay. Playa Larga is important. Um, it is the hub where we base ourselves to go visiting out the, uh, in this direction or in that direction or up here toward uh, the uh, Santo Tomas in different days. We spend at least three days there, if not more. It's the hub, as I said, of the location. No, that is not a giant live a crab, it's a, it's a statue, which kind of represents the entrance to Playa Larga. And it's a buzzing little uh, little town. Uh, it's a town that you can, uh, that where there are many visitors, uh, lots of people coming to visit. You can probably walk from one end to the other town on the main road here in about 20, 25 minutes. It's bustling, it's active. There are uh, casas particulares like this, the uh, Airbnb kind of operations, as a, a homestays, as Sole likes to call them. Uh, there's uh, this tiki restaurant here and other locations, and there's always construction. You see construction in the back. There's about, at about every third home here is a kind of B&B &B operation. And you can see here's the, the Casa del Sol where we, we're staying in our group. Over here, there's Sole uh, talking to some of our people. These are some Cubans and some of our visitors. And here, there's always construction. They're building a, a second story to their, uh, to their uh, homestay operation. It's uh, very interesting. And uh, the folks there are quite um, friendly to us. Speaking of friendly, here's the Casa Ana. And I mentioned before, our friend Adrian. Here he is again, here I am. This is back in 2020, I think it was. Um, uh, and here he is uh, holding a, one of the rare feeders, rare hummingbird feeders, where indeed uh, this is one of the key locations for bee hummingbird to come in to the site. Uh, when uh, Adrian set up uh, the Casa Ana, the backyard was in complete disarray and he completely, uh, they completely reorganized it, did some uh, uh, fascinating plants and planting there, made it attractive for birds and uh, birders. Uh, so you could stay there, you know, and uh, hang out, watch the black-throated blue warbler come to the, to the uh, feeders or the yellow-faced grass quit or the parallel warbler and stay there all day. You can sit on the bench right there and uh, take pictures of these uh, warblers and, and the grass quits and the hummingbirds as they come uh, on a regular basis. But we also leave here and go and enter the park itself, uh, the Gran Parque Nacional Montamar. It's not unlike the um, Everglades. If we've driven on the Everglades road all the way down to uh, the end of the road, Flamingo, and but they're here with flamingos. And this is one of my photos, just a snapshot of the flamingos that we drive past. Uh, it's Everglades like, it's a um, very interesting situation with lots of um, mangroves. We get shorebirds, uh, waterfowl, long legged waders, and uh, uh, rails, uh, and uh, raptors, and other birds. Among those are raptors, including uh, the snail kite, which is uh, common in that lo location. We get to see that uh, regularly as we drive down uh, toward the end of the road. Uh, but among the snail kites, so we look for another black raptor. 
and that's the uh, Cuban Blackhawk. This is indeed my wonderful photo of a Cuban Blackhawk here. You can just barely see it there, but we had uh, one land close to the bus uh, two trips ago, and I just snapped that particular picture. It's a wonderful shot, and we get to stand in a bunch of, uh, to visit a bunch of uh, uh, little towers, uh, observation towers, and uh, there's our group from the bus, in including a carload of people who also were coming down with us as we're watching the birds. And there is yet another wonderful um, Black Hawk. It's 23 kilometers from the town of Playa Larga to the end of the road. And uh, we, it takes us, you know, maybe two hours or more going down. And uh, at the end of the road, we may see some uh, flapper rails and some um, saw birds along the edge. And as, as I said, uh, waterfowl that may be wintering there, waterfowl from the United States and Canada that may, that may be wintering in this particular area. After leaving Zapata, uh, the, this particular road uh, in the, uh, uh, to check out the mangrove orientation and, and uh, what we're going to see. We may go back and go to uh, the interior to Bermeja, the refuge of uh, Bermeja, which is a, we're leaving here, a bunch of us. Uh, we've just come from the inside. Uh, we walk maybe 200 yards to this um, um, fence. It's a solid wall, a wooden wall, where we stand behind. And uh, oh, by the way, as we go down, we definitely look for a uh, Cuban parrot, which is invariably in the area. But we go down to the end of the road and we look for things like blue headed quail dove, dove on the other side of this uh, barrier that we stand by. Because our hosts, who are responsible for the jurisdiction of the, that particular refuge, will have known that we are coming and they will spread um, cracked corn there. And that'll bring in the blue-headed quail doves. And sometimes the blue-headed quail doves will leave the other side of the fence and get onto our side of the fence, where there's sometimes some spilled uh, cracked corn also, and be at our feet. Uh, they will move around uh, our very feet. Um, and sometimes taking a shot is, is difficult because you're getting too close. But among them, there's often a gray uh, fronted quail dove. This is a photo by one of our participants, uh, James Hill, who went with us. And, um, and they're there. He was um, quite cooperative. On the way out toward the road, we'll have uh, a whole bunch of uh, human parakeets. And that takes care of our visit um, to the Bermeja area. We can take another side trip to the little town of Palpite. Uh, and visit our friend Bernabe and his wife. There's Bernabe and his wife uh, with flowering uh, plants here. Uh, this is our group uh, of busload of people. Uh, here's one of the feeders, uh, one of the hummingbird feeders. And we're searching the trees. What are we searching the trees and the feeders for? Uh, we're searching the trees and the feeders. Uh, excuse me. Yes, for this for this particular bird. Uh, this tiny itsy bitsy bird, that's one of my fabulous photos again, is a male uh, uh, bee hummingbird, smallest hummingbird in the world. And here we are in 2018 with their nest or reading the instructions for this uh, uh, humbug. It's a feeder where you put in uh, bananas, you let the bananas ripen and attract uh, fruit flies. And uh, so the hummingbirds not only get uh, the nectar from the uh, hummingbird feeders, but they get uh, the meat, so to speak, of uh, the uh, uh, the fruit flies that come that are attracted and breed around the uh, uh, the humbug. Uh, the, there's the humbug there. Two years later, in 2020, the first shot was 2018, and there is a really decent photo of a male um, bee hummingbird and a female bee hummingbird in uh, in uh, Bernabe's backyard. They get so used to us there. They're so used to the people that Ben and I can use one of these feeders here. I'm showing you them both in the picture and in my hand. Uh, these are feeders that we brought in. They're about a buck a piece again, uh, but a rarity on the island. He, uh, ben and I, uh, uh, exists by uh, 
by the graciousness of uh, birders that come to visit and bring feeders and, and bird equipment uh, and the material for him. And here he is with a bee hummingbird coming to his feeder on the left and the right. And here's even a better look again, a bee hummingbird on the left uh, coming to uh, one of those feeders. And on the right, I don't, I dropped this picture from uh, someplace on the internet. I don't know how the person got the bee hummingbird at the end of the, uh, the number two pencil, but there you go. It's very, uh, it gives you a good size perception also of this tiny, lovely little hummingbird. Also in the back of Ben uh yard is another one of my favorite endemics that is the Cuban Oriole, uh, which is uh, a fascinating looking blackbird. So we've gone to the town of uh, Palpite and uh, we are gonna take another detour to the interior, as I mentioned, the interior going to um, Santo Tomas. This is the town of Santo Tomas. Uh, and we're going there specifically for the Ferminia. This is here is a mural of the Ferminia, which is the Zapata Wren. Uh, the, here's the little school in the town of Zapata. Schools are very recognizable. Uh, the identification, the field marks for a school, for an elementary school in Cuba are quite simple. There's a Cuban flag and a bust of the national hero, uh, Jose Marti. And you can uh, find them there. Uh, we uh, visit the school. We visit the students. Here's one of the doctors whose jurisdiction covers the little village. Uh, by the way, the school and the students, there were more than four of them, as I recall. And here is Michael speaking to the teacher, the teacher aide, the doctor, uh, about um, uh, birders and going to uh, coming, why we're coming to Santo Tomas. They know very well because they're ready for us. Why are they ready for us? Because they have these boats going out on the canal. This, this canal was built many years ago. I think 1919, it's over 100 years old. It was built to, um, provide um, easy access to the outside world, quick access to Havana and other places, built by a guy by the name of Salas. So goods and services could come back and forth. We take the canal out, almost gondola-like with the poles uh, that our assistants come and take us out in two or three of these boats. Um, and we go out and we wait. We wait on this platform and we wait. There's Ernesto. Uh, with his uh, ever-present uh, camera with large lens. And here we are waiting and waiting and waiting. And Ernesto will play the tape and we'll eventually play and bring in Ferminia, a fabulous shot of mine or two fabulous shots of mine, uh, adequate but uh, not terrific, the uh, Zapata Wren um, in the uh, mangroves. But here is a really good shot of the Zapata wren. To me, it's not unlike a smaller cactus wren. It's, it's a bigger than our uh, Carolina or, or house wren by far, and just a little smaller than the cactus wren. But unlike cactus wren, it isn't quite friendly. That is to say, it does, it's, e it's not easy to see or find. Um, it's, uh, this is a great shot of the bird itself. And that's what the situation is. And as we leave, the town we're looking for some other birds. Um, we'll make sure that we give our uh, gondoliers, for want of a better word, our assistants, um, some gifts for them. And uh, in this case, we uh, here's Michael giving um, our our guides, our, our our friendly local people who took us out on the boats, uh, a bunch of hats. And what are on the hats? Invariably, they're bird hats with uh, birds on top. We all have baseball caps that are bird hats. But the, in this case, I think the blue one in particular was a, a Chicago Cubs hat. It was right after the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. And the Cubans are big baseball fans, big baseball fans. And so they really appreciated not only the bird hats, but uh, the uh, hats with the cubbies on it. Then we go back to our location in the Playa Larga. We'll take a break before dinner. We'll take a, a, a swim 
by the by the uh, top of the bay, invariably there'll be tourists there, and they're not American tourists. They are usually French or, or Swedish or Israeli, um, but uh, they're not Americans. Very few Americans, I think. Uh, or we'll take another walk um, down the, this particular um, trail uh, that we often visit, that many of us will go to, and we'll take a drop in this cenote, this limestone um, uh, pool for a dip and a swim. And uh, that's a real treat. So we've done Zapata, Zapata Swamp, Playa Larga, those side trips that we took, those three or four side trips. We have spent our time at the beach. We've had some good meals um, by our hosts for particularly breakfast and uh, dinner. Uh, they can be pretty sumptuous and uh, had a gracious time with our friends, but now we're leaving there and we're going to go into the capital where we actually started, uh, Havana. Uh, Havana is a fascinating city. It is uh, beautiful. It's under different levels of repair at all times. This is an old building. I may have taken this in 2017. And speaking of old, uh, here are mid 50, early 50s cars. Uh, uh, looks like uh, Chevys and uh, Oldsmobiles and uh, Fords, among other things. And we'll go visit some of the historic buildings. This is the old uh, presidential palace, which is now the Museum of the Revolution, Museo de la Revolución. And here's a typical street. They're, they're narrow. There's a uh, that's either an Oldsmobile or a Chevy. I can't tell at this point that red part, but they're narrow streets. And uh, here's a picture um, of an Airbnb location where we were on the second floor and taking a picture down the road to the Capitol. And the Capitol looks, the Capitolio looks familiar, not unlike uh, the design of our US Capitol, uh, a little slimmer in shape, but indeed it's the same kind of classical design. Among other places we'll visit in the town in Havana is the very famous Hotel Nacional, uh, a location in the 40s and 50s that was famous for uh, actors showing up, singers, um, gambling, what have you. I mean, there are pictures of uh, Frank Sinatra in the, uh, in the hotel. Uh, this was a mafia center, among other things, uh, before the revolution. It's a very interesting place. We'll stop by in the back for a drink or two. Here's my friend Larry Balch, who's our driver, Ronell. But, you know, we'll have, uh, who knows, red legged thrush at our feet, bopping around uh, in the trees. The trees around the backyard of the Hotel Nacional are great for birds, particularly migrants from uh, uh, our shores that have reached the island of Cuba. Also in the town of, in the city of Havana, we'll take a stop at the uh, Havana, uh, University of uh, Havana here, S seen here. These are the famous steps. And these are our friends Alieni and Lourdes working at the University of Havana. They are in our bus and smiling because we stopped by their office to give them some uh, nature and bird coloring books for students and the projects that they're having to engender bird and nature enthusiasm among uh, the students, the young people. Um, their coloring books is the very young people in, uh, uh, in the schools in the Havana area. More on that uh, a little later. Uh, as I said, the buildings are fascinating. Here's two examples of a building in repair in Havana basic repair, and here's ones that seems to be totally repaired with the characteristic laundry on the balcony. Uh, these are three buildings along the Malikon, the, the famous roadway that are obviously all repaired um, and brought back to their historic look. Uh, here's a, a hybrid building uh, that had its front repaired and replaced to look like it did in the past, but the interior and the back, the guts of the structure is this, uh, I believe it's a hotel, and solely correct me if I'm wrong when we, uh, when we get to that. We will be staying at a, uh, again, we don't stay at a hotel. We will have our guests at, uh, you know, 
three, four, five of these apartments that are uh, Airbnbs, uh, homestays. Um, we were at this one with the awning up here. Uh, here's Sole. There are three bedrooms here. There are uh, three couples uh, staying in this particular uh, Airbnb operation, three or or more. It's uh, very comfortable. And here's a view from the from the balcony, looking down at the uh, Museo de la Revolución in this tank, and a mixture of uh, old cars and new. But you know, uh, Havana is fascinating, and you always carry your binoculars. Why do you always carry your binoculars? Because there's birds in the town and in the corners and everywhere there may be something, especially along the, the, uh, the walkway in Havana itself. We'll have brown pelican and royal terns, the Caspian terns also coming by. Uh, there'll be um, in the summertime in particular, um, the uh, uh, Cuban martin and Antillian palm swifts. Um, also, um, and you won't be terribly surprised, of course, the Eurasian collared doves uh, that have uh, found their way to North America have also reached uh, the Caribbean in, in Havana in particular, they're there. And they serve as food for the peregrines who may be coming by there. I've seen peregrines on the buildings, on the tall buildings um, in uh, downtown Havana. Uh, taking advantage of uh, the full fare of Eurasian collar doves and others. The walkway along the um, Malecon here is very famous, including views of the Castillo. And here's where we see seabirds and sometimes some shorebirds like uh, uh, ruddy turnstones uh, on the coral reefs here. But we'll also take an important side visit uh, that uh, it's become a location that we uh, truly love. It's the uh, 600 hectare large uh, Jardin Botanico Nacional, the National Botanical Gardens, which is about, oh, 25 kilometers outside the center of town. Uh, there are 4,000 plant species in this particular place. Uh, it's uh, wonderfully kept. It, uh, they have different sections of the botanical gardens representing different parts of uh, the world and um, of uh, Cuban um, trees and plants. And it's a great place for us to see the uh, uh, Eastern Meadowlark, which they call the Cuban Meadowlark, the non-migratory Cuban Meadowlark, which is probably, uh, or at least our Cuban colleagues insist that it's a separate species for at least they say good reasons. And you never know. Let's go put it on the list and put it in escrow. It may be a species again soon. Among the wonderful birds we see at the Jardin Botanica Nacional are kestrels. Uh, we'll see both the uh, pale morph here without streaks and the rufous morph. Um, they are really wonderful. Our friend James Hill took this particular picture. And uh, this is a, a, a view of the uh, road in uh, the botanical gardens. It's not very well visited. Uh, although our friends at the museum, excuse me, our friends at the um, Havana University are increasingly using this place for immediate area field trips to teach, um, to teach biology, to teach uh, botany and uh, bird study uh, to students. Uh, by the way, this car is uh, 2006, one of the classic uh, Soviet era motorcycles with sidecar that I took a picture of and in constant repair, but it still seemed to be running. Here's a good look at the Japanese garden section at the uh, botanical gardens, a nice location for common gallinule, for smooth built ani, a good spot for great lizard cuckoo. So this wraps up our three visits to the three core locations that you would almost invariably go to, regardless of who brings you to Cuba and how you get there. These are three locations that you'll probably visit. We take some quick side trips um, on different ends of the island, quick side trips. Um, Guanajuato is here on the east, the north coast here, 
uh, Baracoa on the west, and Topes de Coyantes here in the center. First starting in Guanajaca Vives, uh, on the west on the west tip of the island, it's a very good location for migrants. Uh, indeed, it's a good location. Um, by the way, it's very popular for Europeans come who are interested in scuba diving, diving and snorkeling. But we regard it as an important place for migrants. Indeed, there are even banding stations there, Cuban banding stations. I'm not exactly sure what this is. It probably it may have been a female. Food grows food, and there's Ernesto looking at the scientists working on uh, on uh, the the banding operation. This is the location where we stay, Maria La Gorda, which is a basically it's a scuba diving location, but we use it for birds. And there's a center for the visitors, the the national park of Guanajuato Vives. Uh, at the national park. Here we are um, with our friend Osmani, who's the assistant director of the Guanajuato Guanaja National Park. Um, and we're giving him uh, stuff that we've brought. We're giving him a bunch of uh, feeders, uh, mostly um, hummingbird feeders. In the box here are some coloring books. And here's a, hum a, a bunch of uh, hummingbird uh, calendars. I think this was 2017. Here are some uh, birders here uh, outside the center, checking out the migrants that were in the Guanajuato Vives location. Uh, I want to give you a feeling you remember in the map, Guanajuato Vives is on the meat and the extreme uh, left coast or west coast of the island of Cuba. Uh, lots of migrants, as I mentioned before, the migrants come from uh, Florida in the Keys, they launch themselves. Birds like um, swallow-tailed kites and other raptors, will, as well as uh, land birds, will uh, launch themselves across uh, the straits and uh, to the Cuban shore. They'll move westward uh, along the coast uh, of Cuba to the extreme western tip of the island where the banders band them and where they launch themselves once again off over the over the uh, sea to uh, reach uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So you can imagine that kind of route. Um, another location that we're going to is the North Coast. Uh, these keys over here, these callos over here are very um, interesting. Um, they are lovely beaches. They are wonderful for tourists. But they look like resorts any place else that you could see in the Caribbean. That is to say, you might as well be in Aruba or Nassau or Barbados or Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic. Indeed, uh, there are European tourists who come there from Europe and tourists from Israel and tourists from, as I said, Europe, uh, France, Italy, uh, Great Britain. Um, uh, Scandinavia, uh, as well as many, many uh, Canadians who will fly directly to these coastal uh, resorts, uh, take the bus to the resort from the airport and uh, spend a week there. It's kind of a package deal. And it's uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the island, it's very important because it presents uh, hard currency tourist dollars um, that uh, uh, are necessary in the international market for goods and services. Indeed, most of these resort locations are joint ventures with Italian, Israeli, and um, Spanish in particular uh, companies, like this one, the Cayo Coco uh, Resort, where we'll stay for two days. Now, why would we want to stay here? Well, I want we would stay here to show the people that this is how lots of tourists come to see the island. And they might as well be, as I said, in Barbados or Aruba or, or the Bahamas. They're not seeing Cuba itself, but uh, this is the uh, very nice situation where we have uh, lovely rooms, decent food, um, uh, a pool in the back, but we also get to see some birds that you don't get to see easily at other parts of the island, uh, primarily a species like um, Bahama mockingbird here. 
which is has been fairly common at Cayo Coco and other places on the north coast. Um, uh, the West Indian whistling duck, I've seen it here more frequently than any place else. And our uh, Cuban uh, gnat catcher, not unlike our blue gray gnat catcher, but it has that uh, behind the eye, that uh, black semicircle, which indicates, of course, that and it's, uh, its call, which is distinctive and different. And again, one of my, another good look at uh, great lizard cuckoo there. What's going on in the North Coast is development for tourist dollars, hard currency. Here was a trip I took with uh, our friend um, Gary Markowski and the Cuban, uh, the Caribbean Conservation Trust. Um, with that trip we had, uh, with that bus, uh, we had a, um, uh, a trans tour guide that came with us, he knew his birds fairly well. This was Ray Dell named Ray. Um, he had his own pair of binoculars, which was like a little uh, opera glasses, but we gave him this pair of uh, replacement binoculars and he gave his opera glasses to uh, the bus driver. They were all very uh, appreciative. But this is typical of some of the locations on the North Coast. This is a brand new road that was built through the mangroves uh, to go to yet another facility that's being built or some uh, gas tanks uh, down the road that are gonna be necessary. There's always construction there on the North Coast because they're always eager to bring in tourists from Europe and Canada uh, to bring in, uh, as I said, hard currency. So much for the North Coast. We're gonna go to Sole's, one of Sole's favorite places on the East Tip, Baracoa. Um, it's a beautiful town, undervisited, underappreciated, um, but lovely. It's uh, lovely and clean and healthy, as the sign says. And here's a look of the harbor uh, from one of the locations. It's important to us because it's the, it's the entree uh, to one of the largest national, probably the largest, well, the second largest, uh, national or third largest national park in uh, on the island, the National Park Alejandro de Humboldt. Um, and it's about 270, 280 square miles. It's an important location um, for uh, birds and nature. It's kind of rough going there. Here we are uh, meeting uh, a bunch of uh, the folks who work at the park. There's uh, Giovanni, the park director in the 350 uh, t-shirt that he got from other folks. There I am next to him uh, in the Cuban uh, Trogon t-shirt. And uh, we're giving uh, the folks uh, feeders and uh, this is a uh, calendar for uh, what, 2016. Next to me is uh, El Indio, his nickname is, he's one of the park rangers. And after him is our friend, Noelis, who's a specialist in the snails of uh, Cuba and that part of the island in particular. And, and here we are uh, as we're walking through uh, an, an, the field. Um, it's tough walking to get across this uh, river uh, in which the, the path led to the river and extended on the other side, continued on the other side. Some of us uh, waded through up to our knees, others went by uh, ox cart, I think it was, uh, that was waiting for us because we made those arrangements. But we'll see some nifty birds there. Here's actually a half decent shot of mine on the left of the Cuban green emerald, a good shot of Cuban parakeet by somebody else because it has the red border. And uh, the palomita snails of uh, that part of Cuba are shown here, uh, very interesting snails itself. And that part of Cuba is very um, good place to see one of the endangered endemics, and that's the giant kingbird. It's like uh, the gray kingbird that ranges in Florida, for instance, uh, but it's much bigger. It's like a gray kingbird on steroids, big build, um, big headed, uh, very impressive. And we'll stay in Baracoa in uh, a place, uh, a hotel like this, which was built uh, a um, hundred years ago. 
and we'll watch the uh, Cuban green emeralds come to the, uh, the flowering plants here. And here we are visiting uh, one of the uh, librarians in town. Sole knows all the people in Baracoa. And uh, this is one of her colleagues, our friends at the library. Uh, and we we're giving her, uh, we gave her a bunch of coloring books and here's again, one of the uh, uh, map uh, uh, calendars for the uh, hummingbird calendars for the year. Uh, when uh, the hurricanes hit Baracoa, it's tough going. Uh, I was, I thought uh, sometimes it's hard to repair the buildings. Uh, I originally thought this was uh, hurricane damage, but Sully told me later that it was uh, a fire damage that had reached this building just below the hotel. Uh, but it nonetheless is uh, uh, suffering from repairs because repairing equipment is uh, uh, supplies are hard to come by on the island. One other thing that's easier to come by, unfortunately, is the bird trade. This is an aside on the bird trade. This is in the town of Barakaw. I was, I was on a break there from our group. We were taking a break after lunch and these two guys were selling, I guess they were Cuban grass quits or, or something um, in these particular cages. Um, the bird trade is a problem particularly in this part of Cuba. Uh, the area of Holguin is, um, seems to be a good, a large center for the bird trade, uh, selling birds in cages, wild birds. Here's our friend Carlos Peña. Here, his sister, Lourdes, our guide, uh, Ernesto de Sole. And we're talking where, um, where they work. Uh, Carlos, I believe, well, one of them, Sole, you will tell me, one of them is the director of the Holguin National Historical Museum. And here is uh, uh, Lourdes showing us a poster that was made uh, to protect the native and uh, migrant birds of, uh, of Cuba. Um, and that she uses to teach the students not to trap the birds and to encourage their parents not to buy caged birds and keep them in the house. More on that later, but here's some examples in Holguin. Um, this is, I believe, a Cuban bullfinch. Just as I walk down the street, there's a hanging out by one of the windows. It seems to be that there's almost a status symbol to have a caged bird, so that you are well enough along that you can actually have a bird in a cage and feed it, um, that you've kind of made it. And here's some other in other parts of Cuba. At the left, Playa Larga looks like another Cuban bullfinch. On the right, there's some yellow-faced grass quits in the town of, uh, of uh, Santiago. Here's another in Santa Cruz, another probably Cuban bullfinch, and a Cuban bullfinch in Santa Clara. I mean, they're just about everywhere. Um, here's in Havana itself, Cuban grass quit on the left and indigo bunting, our indigo, our indigo bunting on the right. Um, yes, it's against the law officially, but so is jaywalking in the United States. It's not dealt with terribly seriously, although, and Sully will tell us later, that I think there's a real campaign going on in the last year and a half in Havana itself uh, to crack down on this, especially because we tourists are being encouraged to uh, dissuade our hosts and people at our Airbnbs and our restaurants, our uh, casas particulares, um, uh, to um, not have the not have uh, cage birds, and that we won't uh, we won't go to their particular um, uh, enterprises if they do. Enough said. Topes de Coyantes very quickly is here in the Trinidad area. It's the center for uh, the Escambre Mountains. It's a beautiful. Waterfalls, nifty birds, uh, difficult climbing. Uh, this here we were at the Birds Caribbean meeting. It was a regional meeting, um, 2017. Um, to go from one meeting place to the other, sometimes uh, the Cuban trucks had to bring us uh, from, uh, uh, as I said, one place to the other. We met in this giant old hotel it was a, from the 1950s that uh, became a um, after the revolution, used for tuberculosis patients. But uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of us visiting 
uh, Lopez de Coyantes during this particular uh, uh, summertime conference, and uh, including very many Cubans. And it's a beautiful area in the mountains, um, lovely place to be. It's great for birding, uh, a little steep sometimes going up and down the hills. And here are mostly American birders, including uh, some some Brits and, and others, uh, and as we are birding around the field trips for the Birds Caribbean meeting. Uh, one of the birds we love to see and find there, as well as other parts of the island, are the lovely little Cuban toadies. Here you go, there he is, Cuban grass quit, not inside a, 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 a cage, but out and free. Uh, and when we were at the, uh, Birds Caribbean uh, biennial meeting, um, we brought all sorts of stuff. In our bags, we had three pairs of binoculars, we had cameras in the back, you see. We had lots of hummingbird feeders. We had, um, you'll see here, Ken Kaufman's book in Spanish, more on that later, of the birds of North America. And this was to give to our counterparts, mostly our Cuban counterparts, but even those from other islands who are, um, who need this equipment and don't have it. Easy for us to come by. Every time we go to Cuba, we bring stuff. Um, and it's, it's important to realize that when you go there, you ought to be going with somebody uh, who's dedicated to engaging our counterparts on the island and giving uh, of ourselves. Um, lessons for today, well, it's not always easy to yank out the lessons for Cuba birding and Cuba engagements. Uh, it's a question of who will take you. Um, I have gone with, as I mentioned before, the uh, Caribbean Conservation Trust by Carrie Markowski, who's been leading bird trips to Cuba over 20 years. And uh, he's been doing good stuff there. But most of the time I go at Sole and the Friends Association uh, of uh, uh, St. Augustine, Florida, with Sole, uh, either going with Cuban Caribbean Trust or um, Sole's operation. Sometimes um, you can go with the uh, Birds Caribbean, they have trips there, also very much engaging with our county parts, or our friend um, Joni Ellis from Optics for the Tropics. She has small trips that go there regularly, multiple times a year, except when there's a pandemic. Um, how do you get around? This is the kind of bus that most of us take. It's a Chinese bus, um, holds about uh, 35 people, I suppose. Sully will correct me, we don't bring any more than half of that. We wanna have plenty of room for people. Uh, you have the correct driver who knows his way around, like, um, like our friend here does, our friend Sobe. Uh, Sobe knows uh, Cuba backwards and forwards. We always ask for him and his bus when we possibly can. Um, we have a good relations with him in particular. And you notice this little pin, it's a pin with the um, US and the Cuban flag on it. Uh, we give each of our participants uh, a couple of those, not only for themselves, but to give to somebody with whom they uh, have made connections with. To find out about the Cuba situation, I would definitely recommend you take a look at um, a, a show from nature that you can download or actually watch on the internet is called Cuba, the Accidental Eden. I think it was done around eight, 10 years ago, but it's still very valid, very good. Um, it brings, uh, it discusses among other things, the balance between um, tourism uh, and nature and uh, the existence of the parks and the su sustaining the parks and natural areas from from uh, coral reefs to mountains and the difficulty they have. And of course, the, the threat there is to too much tourism. The Chinese are still poised to come into Cuba and to build multiple, a dozen, more than a dozen um, golf courses to um, appeal to the tastes of American and other tourists who wanna come to the Caribbean to go golfing, enough said. I want to tell you about some books. This is uh, my favorite book, 
and it's uh, Endemic Birds of Cuba by Niels Navarro. Here's Niels signing the book for one of our people here. This is at the town of Palpite, and uh, uh, we're watching Bee Hummingbird there. Um, it's produced by uh, Sole's outfit, the, uh, the Friends Association and their publishing arm, the Ediciones Nuevos Mundos. And uh, it's an extremely good book. It's the only book you really need in uh, English or in Spanish. What Sole does is charge us a little more for the English version so she can give away the Spanish version for our counterparts in the, uh, on the island, especially if they're teaching youngsters. And uh, Niels not only did the illustrations and the text, he has this wonderful code system here on uh, all the birds, uh, be they uh, uh, Cuban trogon or Cuban grass squid or some of the regional endemics of uh, the region. All you need when you go to Cuba is this little book and a field guide to North American birds and you're set. But there is one other classic book, which is still excellent and still available, Field Guide to the Birds of Cuba. Uh, I believe it's uh, Cornell University Press by Orlando Garrido a famous ornithologist on the island still living, and Arturo Kirkano, his co-author. And uh, the folks at uh, uh, Cornell University Press also did a Cuban version, excuse me, a Spanish version for the Cubans. Uh, and that's very good. And I mentioned before Ken Kaufman's guide. Ken you know, has this very useful guide to the birds of North America, which many of you know. Um, but uh, Ken on his own dime, paid for multiple copies, a, a thousand, I can't remember. He paid for it himself for a Spanish version of the guide, not only for um, uh, people in the United States who are more uh, comfortable reading Spanish and learning birds by uh, Espanol, but also for our neighbors, particularly those in Mexico and in Cuba, uh, who's, where our migrants go through their countries um, to uh, winter or to pass through their countries also. And uh, uh, Ken's book is fine also because you can, I love this particular uh, guide to the uh, parts of the bird, which you always find in every, every book. But uh, it's about time that we learn some of the parts in, in Espanol también, in Spanish also. That corona is crown and uh, vientre is belly and uh, flanco is the sides, and ojo is the eye, and wingtip is punta de la ala, to uh, sometimes some of our counterparts appreciate the fact that we can actually speak parts of their language about parts of the birds. Speaking of fine books, Sole and her outfit, Ediciones Nuevos Mundos, this is the coloring book, or one of the coloring books that we were helping her distribute, a little more on that a little later. Uh, this is La Cotorra, the uh, parrot, the Cuban parrot. And here are the birds in uh, the coloring book. And this is the, uh, the cover spread out. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity to teach children. And here's what we're doing. Um, I about th this is about five stories on one, on one slide. The uh, Ediciones Nuevos Mundos does an annotated checklist of the birds of Cuba every year with Niels Navarro. This is what Sole does. Uh, it's a labor of love. It's a, a wonderful and important scientific oriented uh, summary of the birds of Cuba and it's revised every year. Um, this is Sole and Ernesto and our friend uh, Joni Ellis. We're not on the same group, we are in two different groups, but we're meeting on the autopista, autopista numero uno, the uh, number one highway to and from between uh, Zapata Swamp and uh, Havana. We're going toward Havana. Sole and I are going toward Havana on one bus and Ernesto and, and Joni were going away from Havana. And what we did is we weren't gonna need too many coloring books. So um, Sole gave our extra coloring books to Ernesto and Tony for their distribution. I think that's what the story was. And that's uh, Joni's uh, outfit, Optics for the Tropics, uh, where she does a lot of stuff. And you'll hear more about them right now. I've spoken for 45 minutes. 
far too long or more. Um, and um, I'm going to hand this over to Sole to give us a little wrap up on uh, some of the things that uh, she does with the coloring book and we do with Joni and uh, others. Over to you, Sole. Okay, well, uh, uh, Paul, I think you've really uh, covered it so well. Uh, I don't know if anybody's still here, but, but uh, quickly, we'll, uh, I'll just quickly say, uh, we're part of a national campaign uh, that we, and we work with the uh, ornithologists and the biologists in uh, Cuba. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, most important things that we do is to, um, uh, well, it's all educational, but it's to uh, the conservation of, of uh, endangered species. And, uh, and, and, and one of the important things is to, um, to get rid of the illegal caged bird trade. So uh, starting with the small children, um, third graders and up, um, we teach them with coloring books, with uh, playing cards you can see here that are all oriented toward uh, birds in the wild, not in cages. And we have uh, all kinds of posters, um, murals, uh, T-shirts, you Here's can see T-shirts uh, that says "Must leave it and must be." It. More, they're the freer they are, the more beautiful they are. So uh, that's 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 our 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 main thing. And the way to do it is to, as Paul said, to bring uh, equipment uh, that they can use. And uh, you can see here binoculars that we've brought. Uh, Paul brought this. Uh, uh, spotting scope. You might want to mention something. Yeah, else. one of our friends from uh, the Anne Arundel Bird Club gave it, gave me the spotting scope to bring, and I just couldn't find the right opportunity until uh, I went for the first time with Sully to Baraco and elsewhere, and uh, we distributed, uh, we delivered this. This is an old, for those of you old timers, an old bow scope. Uh, uh, I guess it's a Bausch and Lomb Bushnell type bow scope. It's and you can drive a truck over it and, and it still holds holds, uh, holds up. And so the kids are using it and they're sharing it. And we also brought the uh, uh, the tripod, of course. It was the good stuff. And we brought these binoculars um, also. Go ahead, Soleil. You want to go to the next one? Yeah, yeah, let's go. All right. So, uh, yeah, here you can see an example of one of the murals that, uh, that, that, that was done. Uh, and these children are part of, part of the... Uh, uh, group of, they call them special interest groups among the kids. The kids are particularly interested in nature and they do field trips. Uh, they plant mangroves, um, do a lot of bird watching and, um, and, uh, they, they, and paint, this, paint this particular mural. And if you see a close up of the mural next. Well, let's go back. I'm going to see okay. the, 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 uh, the. Oh, yeah. The script here says, these are happier in nature, not in your house, right? Yep, there, right? You there you go. There you and go. And this, this particular logo yep. was? <laughs> I love this. Uh, I, the Cape Cod Bird Club uh, contributed uh, to this, this particular project. And so um, it, while the, when they made the mural, they put their, their insignia there, but uh, they misspelled, misspelled uh, cod and made it cop. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I mentioned it to them, but I thought it was so cute that uh, we thought we would just leave it that way. Uh, here's another uh, uh, young artist working on the mural. And on the left is Ines, who's the, uh, she's the mover and shaker of the project in the Eastern part of Cuba. She's from Santiago and um, she is, uh, just amazing. She has incredible amount of energy. She's mobilized the whole uh, uh, eastern part of Cuba in terms of children and um, awareness of the importance of protecting uh, our, our, uh, these important bird species. Before we go to our last slide, I want to say something about other kinds of equipment. I remember my first trip to Cuba. I, I brought stuff in 2006. I bought stuff from uh, um, uh, the late, great Betty Peterson and, and Birders Exchange, but she had me bring uh, 
art supplies. Yes. And, um, and the uh, artists in Cuba, particularly the na naturalist artists in Cuba, um, did not have any canvas. We brought them some canvas and were short on paints. Indeed, instead of canvas at the time, you know, this is 15 years ago, 16 years ago, whatever, they were painting on cardboard. Yes. Instead of on cupboard boxes, uh, instead of on good. But now, you know, we, we have young artists like this shown here able to take advantage and spread, spread the good news about birds and about bird conservation and uh, uh, teaching their parents, good, yeah. goodness knows that birds are belong in the wild and not in cages. Right. So this is, this is the last picture with Sole on the right uh, with a uh, Indian <laughs> um, uh, Cuban parrot. Uh, she, wouldn't, she wouldn't ever uh, take uh, a picture with one that was uh, captive and that was free to fly. So this is an injured parrot. And here's a picture on the left of a bunch of us on, uh, this was, I believe this was um, New Year's Day about four years ago, Sole. Yes. So yeah. The Tiki restaurant, which we showed earlier, uh, Cubans and Americans um, who uh, were together, uh, having a good time, sharing their experience and their knowledge and, uh, making things better for each other. And this is part of the message for birds, for people, and for conservation connections. There you if go. you want to know, to know more, you should look up Sole's operation, friendshipassociation.org, and uh, find out more about uh, the trips that are taken and the uh, contributions that uh, can be made. And come with us to Cuba next time. Exactly. Next time, yes. soon, yeah. right? That's what I wanted to say. Um, it because of the pandemic, of course, we've been uh, 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 all, almost a year uh, without without doing trips to Cuba. Um, so we hope to do several big trips back to back in uh, in the in uh, January, February, March through April of next year. Indeed, our friend Kurt Schwartz was. Um... Of, of the Howard County Club was scheduled to come with us a uh, couple two months ago, and the trip had to be canceled. Yeah, yeah. And but uh, he's he's on our list to go the next time, the very next time we go. Rescheduling, and we'll do yeah, two, or three, two or three more. So, um, and hopefully, we'll get back into the swing of things. But uh, I will be going in August, and I've got like fifteen pairs of binoculars. Uh, some what they call a data show. I don't know a projector, which they use for educational things, all kinds of, and and a lot of medical equipment too, medical supplies also. So uh, we haven't stopped. We keep going, and uh, and we we will be picking up very quickly. I wonder if there are any questions. If anyone has any questions, Mary, can you take care of us there? Yeah, there's nothing in the chat. Um, everyone is welcome to unmute and ask questions. I just want to say that was an excellent talk. You just covered it all. I love the conservation that you do and bringing the binoculars and the and the telescope, the science scope for them to actually see is really connects them to the natural world. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for doing that. And, and I'll just say, you know, we can do. Thorough birding. We we see we see virtually all the endemics in the areas that we go visit. Um, it's not that we're missing anything by by engaging with our counterparts and, and sharing with them the experience and the equipment. We get it all. As a matter of fact, if we just got the birds, you wouldn't be in Cuba. You might as well be somewhere else. You can check off a Cuban bird on your life list, but you won't know anything about Cuba unless you come and and meet the people who make it all happen. Right. And this is this is what's the big difference, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I went to Cuba in 1999. Ooh. Yeah, with the bird, uh, well, Wild Wings, which is a British group. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I have my Cuban trogan here, see? Oh! There you go. <laughs> yeah, there he is, he's That's on our wall. <laughs> Yeah, so we stayed uh, in uh, various places like you did, and uh, we actually, at the end of the formal trip, we rented a, uh, a, a 
a car, which you had to pay for cash because you can't use yeah. American credit cards there. Oh, we had cash and we went out to the far west in Cuba to a national park out there, which we hadn't visited and did some birding. So we're driving, we're one of the few private cars on the road at that time. Almost everything else was a, either a truck filled with people or buses and cool. almost no private cars. Yeah. So uh, that things have changed quite a bit since then. 1999 is a long Thank time ago. Sure. I did. So Indeed. a wonderful country and, uh, and uh, wonderful people. We had Arturo Kirk Connell stay with us for two weeks too when he was working at the Smithsonian about 15 years ago. Oh, that's yeah. terrific. That's yeah. great. Well, anyone who, who wants to know anything more, please uh, write us, uh, email us, call us, whatever, um, and we can chat. But uh, it's been lovely uh, being with you tonight. Thank you so much for having us. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So will the um, tours resume after the pandemic? Oh yeah. We're, no, we're uh, as I say, I'm going in August. Uh, it's a oh, bit yeah, hot, really. It's a bit hot for um, for any kind of heavy birding, but uh, but, uh, but we will start in January. We will start in January, which is really the best time. January. Which is really February, the best time. March, January. March, April, April. We'll be doing bird. We'll be doing bird. Cuba expects to have everyone in the country vaccinated by the, by. They were talking about the end of August, but I think it'll be a little bit longer than that. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other the other situation is in Cuba. If you throw a rock, you hit a doctor. There are doctors everywhere, right? So <laughs> this is true. So what is their incidence of uh, COVID nineteen being in Cuba? Uh, do you have any idea how much? Yeah, it's under control. It's under control. Yeah, it's it's good. Yeah, good. When they when they shut the country down, people people are used to taking orders. Yeah, yeah. that's that's right. It's it's country's actually shut down pretty much right now. Um, there's there's some difficulty in terms of Sully, You you may know better. In the countryside, people are, seem to be doing fine. In the city, there's uh, some difficulty in food distribution because because they are shut down and and it's tough going, right? Yeah, there are food shortages, there are uh, medicine shortages, there's shortages of everything right now. The, the uh, tourist industry must have shut down completely last year. Oh. Have you, uh, how, how are people, you know, how are these, sort of the guides that you deal with, any idea how they, they've been faring? You yeah, know, well, I, I yeah. talked to them, I just spoke to Michael today, I had a long chat with him. Um, they, they, they're making, they make do, they make do. Um, they make yeah. do, um, yeah. hoping that you know things will pick up soon. Uh, but they're quite resilient. It's a resilient people. They're they're used to hardships, and so yeah, yeah. yeah that they're you know as I say, apart from food shortages and um, medical shortage. I mean, everyone's complaining about not having analgesics, um, antibiotics, things like that. Right. So that's unfortunate. But but as I but other than that, I haven't heard a lot of complaints. <clears throat> yeah, as I mentioned, of course, you know, the uh, Cuba relies heavily on hard currency that comes from tourists these days. Yeah. You know, and, and so they're not getting the uh, the European tourists, let alone the American tourists. Robin, you know, you, you, we're talking about the Canadians of big time. They love to go to Cuba. In in the winter time, uh, and there are lots of Spaniards and Brits and Italians and and others uh, who go there, and they're not there now. I mean, they just it's just uh, as I said, shut down. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, come with us. Yeah. I know uh, Kurt's going to come with us as soon as uh, as soon as uh, we're able to go. I know Dolly's going to check. You know, this is a a uh, a trip she's taken to check things out. But um, you know we'll we'll take a group in that in that bus that's half full because we don't want we don't make it any any more crowded than we have to. Yeah. We take a dozen people in a in a bus that holds you know twenty people and it's it's a good experience. Put How long the, is your trip? About twelve days. So how long is it? Twelve days. Yeah. It depending on flights. It can be eleven days or twelve days. It really depends on 
the okay. flight schedules because they often don't have flights every day. So, you know, you might go on a Monday and you have to come back on a Thursday. So it'll be a, between 11 and, and 13 days, say. That's a good long trip. Oh, yeah, but you, you, I mean, really, you need it. You, you know, and you don't, and you only see a very small, I mean, like Paul said, yeah, the three, you only the three do those, three, those yeah. three main places for, 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 for a trip. And now people who have been already once or twice, we might take them to the East Coast um, to do another, you know, to do something. But the majority of the, certainly the endemics, you'll find in those three locations. And then, you know, there'll be one or two that like, like he said, the, in the Cayo Coco, you can get one or two very local endemics. Uh, so that's for obsessive uh, birders. <laughs> but generally you, you um, those three locations will stay two or three days in each place. Sure. Finish it off in Havana. Do the math. Yeah. Yeah. Three locations, three days each, and you know, arrival and departure date, that's, not, yeah. that's 11 days. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. You can't really, really do it in much less. No. And you need yeah. some sort of a, a visa, don't you, to, to get? Yeah. A, a yeah US that's, that's easy. That's easy to do. That's oh, not right. And currently, you have to go with a an approved operation, an approved organization. Correct, Soleil? Yeah. You, you, you. There, we're not allowed to go to um, Cuba as tourists. Yeah. Tourism right. is not allowed from the United States. From the state, but state department, it has to be. Um, what, has to what you go state. as? People to people, right? Sorry. Yeah. Well, right now, I think even Trump has eliminated that category. Yep. But, but it has yet to be undone. Support, it's called support for civil society. Right. Support for civil society. So we do that everywhere. Any do that everywhere. Any. Because we stay in private homes. Because we stay in private homes. Oops, I'm going to try. We eat in private Oops, restaurants. Eat in private restaurants. And uh, we, you know, communicate. And uh, we, you know, communicate. The Cubans uh, have great exchanges with the Cubans. Uh, I don't know why I'm getting feedback here. Somebody, somebody else was unmuted. I think you should be okay now. Oh, okay. Anyway, that's basically it. But it, but tourism is not allowed from the United States. And well, thank we're, you also, very much. we're also not allowed to stay in many of the hotels uh, from, from the United States State Department has a list of hotels where we are not allowed to stay. So we have to, you know, we have to work around those restrictions. But thank you. Thank you very much. It's it very nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your, your presentations. Excellent. Well done. A couple of people had mentioned that in the chat.